Welcome back to Pocket Sketching. Now we're ready to start putting everything together. Let's start with a fun exercise. The next perspective lesson is focal point. And the easiest way to show it to you is have you put your arm out at full length with your thumb up. Now focus on your thumb. While you focus on your thumb, how well can you see what's behind it? Now focus on what's behind it. How well can you see your thumb? You can't. You don't have an infinity lens in your eyes. A camera does. So the camera will have the blades of grass up here in focus, and the bushes back there in focus, and the trees and the mountains all in focus. But you don't see that way. You have a whole range of focus. When you look at something, something catches your eye. That's a focal point. Now, if you wait a few minutes, you'll probably pick two or three more. But you have to stay on just one. I have a marvelous example of one I did in which there are three focal points, and I want you to see, I want you to see if you can figure out the focal point. So, just a minute. Here it is. Now, if you can't figure out the focal point, there is a reason. There are three of them. So out of curiosity, I decided after I'd done this, this was done at El Conquistador Resort in Tucson, after I'd done this, how long would it take me to take one focal point out of this mess and elaborate on it and have it work? So I picked that one right there. This is 11 minutes later. You can make sense out of this. That's an 11 minute sketch. Focal point is dreadfully, dreadfully important. All the rest of that stuff is out of focus. The stuff in front of you, right in front of you, is out of focus if you're focusing 50 feet away, or 100 or 200. I have another really nice botch for you. This took forever. It has every leaf on the tree. The only thing that saved it was having light spaces here where I could put in dates. This is supposed to be a palm tree. By the way, when I got done with this, I was so fed up, I quit for the day. It will wear you out if you try to do that. So now let's see how you're going to use this in actual space. Or another thing that's important, I want to tell you something else about the camera right now. Something really important about a camera and about you. A camera sees what's there. You bring to the spot where you have a focal point, not just what's there, but your entire life experience and how you're feeling that day. That's why there's magic. You come back the next day at the same place, it won't be the same. You put the magic in. This is why sketching is so much more rewarding than just photography. When you want the big picture and you want to see everything, the stuff you didn't have time for, take a camera picture. But when you want to have an intimate experience, sketch what you think you see. It will have magic. That's why sketching is fun. Now let's get on to another little part of this. I want to give you an idea of something that's important. This is a photo of an adobe building. Now when you're looking at it, spend a minute to decide how you happen to know that's adobe. Why isn't it stucco? Why isn't it plaster? Why isn't it lathe? Why isn't it slate? When you've figured that out, it's probably a crack pattern and the color. Get only that right in one place. The rest of the building is the color. Get the crack pattern once. It's going to work. Here's an example of that same photo. How many bricks are on here? Not very darn many, but you see an adobe and it's strong, and it has a bit of the crack pattern, bit of the fence. Other than that, it really doesn't have any bricks. Here's a scene with a focal point. That little red coach belonged to Trail Dust Town. They left it out in the sun. It's been completely destroyed. I'm glad I caught it before it was destroyed. But there's bricks all around it. They're hinted at. You don't see any bricks over here. You don't really see any bricks here. There's enough brickness that you've got an idea that there are bricks. Same thing down in the walkway. Hint at it. There's your focal point. You can't miss it. Here's another one. Again, bricks all over the place. 
but you see the reflection of the car in the window. It was a sports car that was behind me. It is so much fun to pick the focal point and then stay on it and don't move to the next thing. If you see multiple focal points, you've got multiple sketches and you can do them one at a time. Okay, now we're going to switch to something a little bit different. Sorry about that. Next, I'm going to give you some photographs and you can use any one of them. You get to pick your focal point and I'll go over that in a minute. But there is another part added to this. What is now added is the timer. I time myself for 25 minutes on all sketches, unless it's architecture. If it's architecture, I'll give myself another five minutes because some part of it has to actually be accurate. The timer is right here. Standard old kitchen timer. And at home, this is what I set. When I'm out in the field, on the edge of my pad, remember these pads are six and a half inches long. On the edge of the pad, I mark off the margin. Anything can go in that margin. So I look at my watch and start out with, let's say it's 10.55. Then I mark 20 minutes later. So there's 11.15. When I hit 11.15, I have five minutes to finish. Or, if it's a bomb, I get to walk. And that's one of the greatest pleasures in pocket sketching. Your mother isn't here. You don't have to finish. If it's bad, leave. Start another one. A banker friend of mine once said, it's much easier to give birth than to resurrect the dead. Don't try to resurrect the dead sketch. It's going to take forever you won't get much of a return on your invested time. Instead, start another one. Have fun. This is all for pleasure. And we get to another point here. Why are you doing this in the first place? Are you learning this so that you can compete at art shows? Have paintings that your friends will make exclamations about? Or are you doing it for pleasure? If you're doing it for pleasure, back off and have fun. Enjoy yourself. Learn. Put down records of where you've been. Incidentally, when you bring a sketch home, you have spent the time editing all the extra stuff out to the focal point. But when you look at that sketch, you remember everything that was there, probably even the smells and the sounds. You can make multiple paintings in the studio from one sketch because the computer of your brain remembers it all. That's the fun of it. So now I'm going to have some examples, but I'm going to show you a couple things about two of them first, and then you're going to work with a timer from these examples or any photograph you like. You can pick your own photographs, but find your focal point. So first, I'm going to pick this one. There's an extreme dark in here. So what do you do with the extreme dark? First, I have to find a focal point. In my case, I like the focal point of this group of trees. So if I'm going to make that a focal point, and how high up is the horizon? This is very faint. Use the edge of your pen if it's going to be faint. And I can change it later. Bring that down, and right in here is the focal point, and it's extremely dark. How do you get extremely dark? You do not have black paint. Black paint, by the way, is boring, really really deadly, boring. You have your magic pen, and there's your black. Fill it in. It's important. And if this is my focal point, I want to see it. So it is going to have high contrast. As you're coming away from the edge in this particular photo, it gets lighter and lighter. Notice fewer lines, but it's going to be a value, not a crosshatch. And less distinct as it's going away from the focal point. But it may still be black. In this case, it is. And when we get to the bottom of this, I'm not going to do the whole thing. I want you to see at the bottom when you're coming up on that extremely light water, what you're going to have to do to handle the black line against 
an extreme light. The water's horizontal, by the way. It's a lake. This is black. Put enough lines in that you can get black. These pins, if you remember to put the lid on when you're not using them, will go a very long way. And when they're wearing out, keep them until they're worn out because you, you'll have an automatic thin line when you want it out of a nearly worn out pen. Brand new pen will give you a fairly heavy line, lots of ink. I'm going to go this far over and come back up here. Fades into those other trees. But right here where you have the contrast of the dark and the light of the water, you're going to have to get that dark out of the way first. I'll show you why. First, I'll do it and make a mess so that you can see the mess. Is the water dirty enough yet to color the paper by itself? Nah, almost. I'm going to use the cerulean blue. I'm going to put it right next to the black line. This is curious. The black line is going to run into that cerulean blue. You know, I'll bet cerulean blue is heavy. Heavy pigment. What happens if I had chosen ultramarine? And make it very light. It's going to invade. You don't want it to invade. I have to admit, I've got enough control that it, that wasn't bad. I wanted it to come out worse. Wet this first. Let it dry before you come in and put that water in. Let's say I'm going to come in here and wet this black area now, right next to that water. I bet it flows into the water. That's Unfortunately, a lot of experience didn't flow in much at all. <laughs> it is a lot of experience. Up here, where I want this to have these sharp edges, make them with the tip of the brush. And then make this little group very high contrast and very obvious, because I want you looking right there afterwards. There's the whole black area. Come in with that nice yellow green. And let's see, it's fairly yellow, fairly, fairly, fairly yellow ochre and green. Notice I just picked them both up. You probably didn't see that. I'll show you in a minute. I pick them both up at one time on the brush. I want some of it to be fairly clean up here. There's clean. Now as you're coming down here, it's going to pick up the black line. And you're going to get those in-between colors. It's going to run. It's okay there. I didn't want it to run up into there. Now this area, I cannot bring a light down into until that is dry and stabilized. So at this point, I would go up and do any other part of the picture. Doesn't matter what. Any other part. Get busy on something else. Oh, the line up here, if I want a really light-edged mountain, look, that line ran into it. But I've got a gray sky. You gotta think ahead of Ted. The line belongs in the gray sky. There you go. This is just like the very first thing you did. The line is now in the gray sky and it'll be stabilized. It becomes clouds. And it is not a problem. Same thing over here. If it's gonna be in the way, think ahead and move it out of the way making the background behind something instead of having it invade. Now there are plenty of things I can do while things are setting up. Uh, purple lake, ultramarine blue. Come over here where it won't make a bit of difference and put some of these colors in. I want this to be very light around that dark so that you see it. 
So I'm going to hold that. This I want thin. This can be thicker. As the color comes out of the brush, it is now thinner and lighter. Quite different. I got the thin part. I want that to have a much lighter color. I think I can get away with putting the background in, in here right now. I'm going to give it a go and see. And I want a light pink, lots of color. You can always come in and modify it later. That's a bit stronger than I planned on having. Oh well. If I don't like it, I'll lift it. By the way, watercolors dry lighter than they went on. Now I'm coming with a very light hand right up to those trees. Now I'm going to change that just a bit. Make it a little bit. This time, put the color in here, squish it out, lift some of this. Now it's lighter. That's a lift again. You've seen the lift before. There it is again. And of course this color would be behind these mountains where the sun hits part of it. And I can come in with that nice purple. This purple should come up over here. You can run that watercolor. I had a uh, watercolor curator from a major museum in one of my classes. She said, you can move watercolor for up to 20 years. So watch this. Just pick that up, put it over there. It is such fun to be able to do things like that. This line held amazingly well, but watch over here. This next part will hold, should hold beautifully. It's almost white. Oops. Thin it way down. And there's the highlight. And come back down in here, put some water down here, and then put some color on it down in this area, leaving the other area light, really light. Still got to get more color. There you go. And that does look a bit like wind on the water. But you get the idea. I want you to see right there. Uh, I'm going to darken some of the mountains over here because they you got too much of a big orange area. So a bit of ultramarine blue, a bit of purple lake. And come in over here. I want a bit of this up here, but not much. Come right over that other color. Pretty nice. A little bit of the color in there. And a little bit of the color down in here. And then go back there. Finish that off. You can see how colorful it is. But you get an idea. High contrast, I want you to see it. If I really want you to see it, I'm going to add a bit of that famous orange. Should have a bit left on my paint set, just a tad, right over this green. You're not going to see it as orange. Instead, you're going to see it pop out at you. So that gives you an idea on that one. Then there's one more I want to show you before you start doing your part of these exercises, and that is clouds. And again, this is working with the pen, and it's important. Here's the photo. Now, in this photo, you can pick multiple focal points. You can pick just this mountain. If you do and you put a line around it, run that line into those clouds. Otherwise, it'll invade the mountain. You can pick just this tree. You can pick just the clouds. But something about the clouds. It is so much out of grade school to put a line on your paper, and here comes a cumulus cloud. And now you're going to try to make it into a cloud. <laughs> By the way, I would have had a time thing over here, and I might also have had a borrow pit over here. Remember the borrow pit? You're going to see it this time. Just put the pen lid on. Hope you did that too. Here you come. You're going to put, try to put sky in around this line. How artificial can you get? Does this look like a cloud? 
highly stylized. <laughs> well, okay, there's another way to make clouds. <laughs> the other way, clouds are water vapor. Give it a chance. This is watercolor. Water, color, water. Things move in water. Okay. Pick up your sky color. Move it around the cloud. Now put it back there. There's your sky. Simplify it if you want to. Come in underneath. Might have little bits of sky popping through. Get rid of that. Put sky up there. You've got time to move. You've got time to do things. Ooh, a nice dark sky. I didn't mean to get it that dark, but you get the idea. Come in over here, pick up that borrow pit. A little bit of gray. Oh, yeah. Now, how's that for a cloud? That works. It's still wet in here. I should be able to tip a few little, little nuances of character inside. Whole different feeling on that cloud. So when you're doing clouds, play around. Don't take yourself seriously. The more you play around, the better they're going to work. Again, if I were going to try to do that mountain edge, and it's dark on this edge over here. Now I want that mountain to work, right? And I'm going to come in and Try to put that mountain color. I'll use the same kind of color I used before. I want more yellow in it. I want more yellow. I'm going to come in here and try to do that. And I'm going to get me a nice gray mountain. Not what I wanted. Okay. Now do it the other way. Same mountain. By the way, every time you do it by hand, it probably will come out different. That's because you're human and not a machine. Enjoy it. This time, turn that into the sky. There you go. You got the sky behind. I want some sky color. I can pick it up from up there. Pick up more from up there. Remember, you can move watercolor for a long time. Come over here. Do the same thing. You can correct that a little later if you want to. Look at that gorgeous sky. And that sky came out of that black line. Leaving you the opportunity now, when it's dry, to put the color on the mountain. But you have to let that dry. So while you're waiting for that to dry, go do something else. If you want to put a few more clouds in there, remember the old lift that we did at first? Such fun. Lift out part of the clouds. Such fun. There goes a lift. And the stuff you lifted will color things if you want it to. It's all a push-pull. Watercolor is an absolute blast. Now I'm going to show you the examples and you figure out your focal point. We'll do them one at a time. And then we'll come back to the highlights of this lesson. There's one of them. This was done up by Sedona. There's another one. It's the one I just used. Here's another one. This is Rialto Beach in Washington. This one is northern New Mexico. Something of note, you don't really see the tree against a light background. That dark cloud, that dark mountain, helped make that tree. And there's a lot of dark in the tree. And then this one. Where's your focal point? Have fun. Notice that the, as you go back against the mountains, those trees become less distinct and go to blue and become lighter. There's yellow in the trees down here. Same lessons come back over and over and over. Oh, and the foreground. <laughs> it's out of focus. 
If you put that in focus, this has to be out of focus. Because you can't see both. Remember the thumb exercise. Okay, did you remember to use the timer? If you forgot, you forgot something incredibly vital. If you use more than 25 minutes and you keep working, you'll put in a second focal point. You'll overwork it and take all the vitality away out of it. And you will fatigue. So remember to mark your time on your paper and use your timer. It'll make a huge difference. Now one more little item. You probably haven't noticed that my paints have been getting messy. Dirty on the far side, clean on the near side. Don't bother to clean up the far side. You don't have to. And now just a few examples of what we've been doing, because I'm not sure if you really noticed. So notice the simplicity of this sketch. Notice that you see almost no tiles, but you have a feeling this is a pond with tile around it. You don't have to do every tile. You only have to do enough to see it. Catch the complementary color scheme. You're going to see that. You can't miss it. On this next one, do you see bricks everywhere? There are, there are some back there, but these bricks at the focal point are pointed out. And this last one, how big do you have to go? You don't. You only have to get your focal point and a little bit to set the atmosphere. Things can be very simple. And now basically a conclusion. What are we going to do next? In the next series of webinars, we're going to show you how to work in the same way that John Singer Sargent did. Tremendous versatility. And we're also going to go outside, do real editing outdoors, and learn to be outdoors with other people and finding out that you're invisible because your work is inside your personal space. This particular sketch was done very much in the manner of Sargent. It used wax as a resist. And we'll be doing that too. So I'll look forward to having you again for another series of webinars. Thanks for being here.